end up sort of giving it the odd sort of verbal swerve. Um, so I don't have a strong opinion, I'm afraid. I know this program is about that, but I don't. So you don't you, you don't really mind if it's if the entirety, the like ninety nine percent of assisted uh, voices or digital voices are female. Um, not really, because yeah. I think actually uh, with a lot of things you get a choice about the voice that you have, even the accent sometimes. Even on your G- annoying GPS thing, you can change it like oh, to that's a, a male. Good point. And you can choose like American male or American English sounding or Australian or whatever. Um, this, this is a key point. Can you change Siri's voice to a man's voice? Because I think that maybe that option should be available. I don't really want my digital AI assistant to be talking back to me, though. Yes. Or getting lippy. That's a very, very good point, talking back. Well, this the report says that we should be calling on technology firms to stop making voice assistants female by default. To quote, this sends a signal that women are docile helpers available at the touch of a button or with a blunt voice command like, hey, or okay. It honours commands and responds to queries regardless of someone's tone or hostility. Yeah. Is that is that a fair point, you reckon? I really don't know because I'm not... Ex- I, look, if it's true, mm. yes, it is a reason- reasonably fair point, I suppose. Um, but you still, you know, you continue to see this in many different ways in um, in society. I was at a media awards thing on Friday night and I was quite surprised to see there, standing on the stage, two um, lovely women, um, young women in, you know, shortish dresses, just standing there to hand out to hand to generally, not always, but to men, um, the awards to give to the people who are receiving them. I could not see really particularly Hmm. the point of that. That's a good point. They could that's have all a, been stacked up in order and picked up by the person. That is that's, weird. That's along similar lines. I think it's probably not the greatest contributor to the patriarchy, patriarchy but it's probably a, a symptom of it. I actually, I've, I've decided I'm actually willing to um, lend my voices if they do want a subservient man uh, for the next Siri. So Tim maybe Cook is listening to this. You'll be maybe. drowning in nappies very soon. You will not have time, <laughs> believe me. You will sound so tired. <laughs> so sleep deprived. <laughs> we should if that's have, the vibe they want to go for. We should have a poll. Uh, who would like Hayden Donnell's voice uh, as their navigator when they go home or on their phone? Go left. Go. At Javois Road. <laughs> Most of us just want George Clooney, regardless. Yes. Sorry about that. Or, wow. Or Idris Elba or, you know. Would you pref- Sorry about that. Would I you- think you're thinking of the I'm, face ad- I'm objectifying their-, um, their voices, of mm. course. It's nothing to do with their looks. What about, what about a genderless digital voice? Because linguists are working on one. Really? Is that, is that what we've come to? That's okay. I guess you want something human, though. This is the thing with your AI. It's kind of nice to have a human voice mm. speaking out. Siri seems like quite comforting at times. Maybe there's some people that are actually like speaking to Siri just for comfort's sake. That's quite sad to think about, but <laughs> <laughs> those people need to be catered for. Do you actually use Siri? I've, I use OK Google, which is, you know, that's isn't that better? You know, because you're not going to say something weird to OK Google. A lot more on bin liners. Uh, to keep the cats out of the rubbish, I've got a big indoor bin that fits the council rubbish bag. No liners needed. The council bag is my liner. Wonderful responses, wonderful panel. Hayden Denell, Claire Delaw, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the panel. Uh, and a big thanks to Caitlin Cherry for filling in this afternoon. I'm Wallace Chapman, back with you 3.45 tomorrow. Bye. 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 This is Checkpoint on RNZ National. I'm Lisa Owen. On tonight's programme, Destiny Church's Hannah Tamaki launches a new political party. It's not a Christian party and she's the leader, not her husband, Bishop Brian Tamaki. Stand by for Hannah Tamaki on the debt cap, immigration, perverts in Parliament and KFC. According to the police watchdog, an officer should never have chased the teenage driver of a fleeing car that crashed, killing two children. The multiple failures that led to the Fox Glacier helicopter crash. The pilot wasn't trained properly for scenic flights. And on your bike, Wellington, new plans are unveiled for a cycleway along a treacherous route between the capital and the Hutt Valley.
RNZ News at five. Kia ora ko Susana Leata with DNA. Investigators have spelt out numerous failures by both the operator and the aviation watchdog, the CAA, before a helicopter crash on Fox Glacier in 2015 that killed all seven people on board. The Transport Accident Investigation Commission has just published its final report on the crash. Its Chief Commissioner, Jane Mears, says the operator's training system was ill-defined and below standard and the pilot wasn't properly trained or senior enough to take scenic flights. She says they found it was unlikely a mechanical problem was to blame. The operator had been allowed to continue providing helicopter air operations with little or no intervention from the CAA, despite the CAA having identified significant non-compliances with the operator's training system and managerial oversight. Jane Mears says photos taken by passengers show snow was falling when they were on the glacier and it's very likely the weather conditions were below minimum flying criteria. An economist says the government's books are world class and it shouldn't be afraid of taking on more debt as the economy slows down. The Finance Minister Grant Robertson says the government intends to relax its debt target of 20% of GDP to between 15 and 25%. That would potentially give it $15 billion more to borrow. Cameron Bagri of Bagri Economics says the 20% target was always arbitrary and the focus should be more on the quality of spending. He says the country is in fine shape regardless of whether it is at 15 or 25 per cent debt to GDP. If we're at 25, we are at the world-class end of the spectrum. That will be a quality number. To me, the real attention here needs to be not just on borrowing per se, but where the money is going, you know, where they're investing in and the sort of return we're getting. And it need not be a cash return, it can be a social return. Economist Cameron Bagri. The police say the officer criticised by the Independent Police Conduct Authority over a fatal pursuit in Palmerston North last year has been given further training on assessing risk. The 15-year-old driver and a 12-year-old girl died when their car crashed into a ditch during the chase, which reached speeds of more than 160 kilometres per hour. A 16-year-old passenger was seriously injured. In its report released today, the IPCA says the officer didn't make an appropriate risk assessment before signalling for the driver to stop and then commencing the pursuit. The acting central district commander, Inspector Chris de Wittener, says the decision whether or not to pursue a fleeing vehicle is one of the most serious situations faced by frontline staff. A new political party backed by Destiny Church says it will appear to appeal to all New Zealanders, not just Christians. Hannah Tamaki will lead the newly formed Coalition New Zealand Party with her husband, Brian, yet to decide what role he will play. Announcing the party's name and vision this afternoon, the couple say they're motivated because the country lacks leadership and is being taken in the wrong direction. Mrs Tamaki says it's time to make a stand. I'm not happy. I am concerned. I am worried. For this reason, I will be leading the new party, Coalition New Zealand, into the 2020 general election with the aim of entering Parliament. Hannah Tamaki, leader of the new Coalition Party. The investigative journalist Nikki Hager has told an inquiry the military breached the rules of engagement in Afghanistan. The Operation Burnham Inquiry is investigating allegations in the book Hit and Run that six civilians were killed in Afghanistan during a New Zealand-led raid in 2010 and the military covered up what happened. Mr Hager, the book's co-author, directed the inquiry to an order from United States Commander General David Petraeus, who at the time said the commander approving the strike must determine that no civilians are present. Currently four out of five attacks conducted during operation that strongly appear not to be compliant with the rules of engagement and Petraeus' civilian protection directive. Nikki Hager says the former Prime Minister John Key, along with two former Chiefs of Defence and some SAS officers, need to be held to account. The Crusaders coach, Scott Robertson, says Richie Moonga and George Bridge are great young men who have been struggling since becoming embroiled in scandal. The pair who will run out for the Crusaders against the Blues in Christchurch on Saturday night are at the centre of allegations of impropriety on the team's recent tour of South Africa. A group of players, including All Black Bridge, are accused of making homophobic remarks to a group of men in a Cape Town McDonald's. Moonga, the All Blacks' first five, is said to have spat beer on a woman and touched her 
chair inappropriately at a bar the week prior. Coach Scott Robertson says the men have been genuine in their denials of the allegations. It's five past five. Former captain Katrina Rore has made a return to the Silver Ferns, being named in the New Zealand World Cup netball squad in Invercargill this afternoon. Rore was surprisingly dropped from the Silver Ferns squad, which played in the quad series in January, but is back alongside with shooter Bailey Mez, midcourt Shannon Saunders and defender Phoenix Karaka. Mez and Saunders haven't played for the Silver Ferns since the disastrous Commonwealth Games campaign last year, when the side failed to win a medal. Karaka last turned out for the Ferns in January last year. The veteran mid-quarter Laura Langman will captain a side which will include Casey Corpua, Maria Folau, Karen Berger, Amelia Ann Ekenasio, Te Paia Selby Rickett and Jane Watson. New Zealand's first game at the tournament in Liverpool is against Malawi on July the 12th. The Football Ferns coach Tom Simani says his side is in a good frame of mind as they head to Europe for the last stage of their build-up for next month's World Cup. The New Zealanders beat Mexico 2-1 in a warm-up game in New York today. Simani says four good days of training after last week's 5-0 loss to the United States has helped them feel much better. We know we've got some, some work to do. We've got another two or three weeks to the World Cup actually start, so we've got time to do that. But as, at the moment, given today's result, uh, you know, we're in a, you know, a positive state. The side's next warm-up is a warm-up game is against England and Brighton. That's the news. Doubts over destiny. Brian Tamaki prophesied that in five years, destiny will be running the New Zealand government. So I don't think God's given him any particular gift of clairvoyance. Sweating over the sky path. Not when you're on your e-bike or, or your e-scooter especially, but no, it's a gentle, pleasant up and over, and hey, we all need our exercise. And shock at a new quake-prone high-rise. To say, well, a building won't hurt anybody as long as there's not an earthquake is like selling a rain jacket that will keep you dry until it rains. Rain or shine, 6 to 9, Monday to Friday morning report with Susie Ferguson and Corin Dan. Then on 9 to noon, voting forms are pouring in in the Queenstown bed tax referendum and accommodation providers are fearful. And after 10, a tell-all insider account of life in the American mafia by the mobster-turned-godfather actor Gianni Russo. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after morning report on RNZ National. Now the short forecast from Met Service to midnight tomorrow. In the west from Northland to Manawatu, also Taumaranui and Taihape. Areas of cloud and isolated light showers clearing from Waitomo northwards this afternoon and fine spells increasing. Areas of fog tomorrow morning. For the remainder of the North Island as well as Nelson, Marlborough and Canterbury, fine weather apart from areas of cloud or fog tomorrow morning. Buller and Westland mainly fine, however a few showers developing south of the glaciers tomorrow morning and the remainder of Westland tomorrow evening. Otago and Southland fine weather. Fiordland a few showers becoming more frequent tomorrow. Chatham Islands fine apart from a few light showers today. RNZ National with Indira Stewart is back with First Up at 5am tomorrow. It's eight and a half past five. Thanks, Susana. This is Checkpoint and I'm Lisa Owen. A voice for the silent majority. That's how Destiny Church's Hannah Tamaki has described the new political party she will lead. Mrs Tamaki and her husband, Bishop Brian Tamaki, together launched Coalition New Zealand today. They say the new party is a response to the harmful policies of the current government and the erosion of New Zealand values. Cameraman Nick Munro and I were at the launch at the executive lounge of the Destiny Church complex in Monaco this afternoon, and I started by asking Hannah Tamaki what her top three policy priorities are. Children, families and prisoners. So you've said... That's what I'm saying today. It could change in another month. Could it? Well, I might find some other passion that I think would might need a little bit of push behind them. Are you committed to those things now, though? Absolutely. So part of the reason that you said you're launching this party is you're concerned about the current leadership in this country. What yeah. specifically concerns you? Well, I think a little bit of discrimination and when you want to help your people and you're not given the opportunity to, that, that's disheartening. Um, so discrimination against who? 
Uh, let me see, somebody that I'm married to, um, an organisation that I absolutely love, like Man Up and Legacy, and Legacy is actually the woman version of Man Up, so I know that people sort of say, we're the woman in all of this, and we're the Europeans in this, well we have Europeans, and uh, the woman version of Man Up is called Legacy. But people listening to this might think that this is a revenge party then, if that's no. the reason it is now, no. because your husband can't get his program into prison and you yeah. feel he's been discriminated against? No, well, I just think that we need some common sense. I think we need some nana staff, some mother staff, some uh, somewhere that the new, everyday New Zealander can relate to. Um, we have a lot of politicians that... I don't know how many of them are grandparents. Um, I haven't you know, looked into it, but I know that I've always had a passion for people. I've always got on well with people. Um, hence, for the fact that I'm not afraid to step into this realm, um, it's gonna, like I said, I'm chartering a whole new life, um, but I'm prepared to do it for uh, the people on the ground. I work and walk with the people on the ground every week. Um, I'm not the sort of person that's distanced from people. Um, I'm relate relatable to people. Um, when people come just for counselling, I help them. And they don't necessarily have to be Christians or in church either. The other thing I'm very, very passionate about is um, young women um, going and having mammograms. I would like a woman, the woman's health system to be changed a little bit. Uh, our 40-year-old daughter diagnosed with um, breast cancer two weeks ago had a full mastectomy. Um, she wouldn't have gone if um, she didn't have such a pushy mother and people around her. But she went and this is the outcome. So for me, I have a ministry called Healing Hands where we, where we um, make, put donations and, and we help families mm. in need, not just women, but I would like the government to pay for women who have got breast cancer on both sides of the family to perhaps get a bit of discount for the, the mammogram that they need to have. So there's a whole lot of things, um, Lisa, that I am really passionate about. Okay, you have said about the leadership of this country that you feel that there is a slide in values and morals. So what is the most harmful policies that you think that this current government has? Can you name me the, the most harmful policy? Well, in the last few weeks, the really one that really, to me, has challenged me is um, not letting man up into the prison where... That's not a policy though, Hannah. Well, I'm not, I'm not creating um, a policy-driven um, reply to you. What I'm saying is that I see how a great organisation who can help offenders being excluded by the deputy leader of the Labour Party. I just want to be really clear about okay. this because you say that this party is separate to the church yeah. and then you keep going back to the, the Man Up program. So yeah. is this political party about getting Man Up into the, into the prison? Of course I'd like Man Up into the prison, but it's not just about Man Up. Okay. It's about families. It's about the family court. It's about um, the health for the right. woman. It's about, um, you know, let's take our time. And I did hear let, you when you've listed yeah. those. Let's I have heard that. Time. Euthanasia, I, I'm, that really concerns me. It's not a, it's not a government policy currently. So yeah. in, in uh, introducing but, but it, your party, yeah, but it's, you it's said there were be. harmful policies. Well, I, I no, it's going to that. a vote. It's going okay. to a vote. Right. So you said there were harmful policies. Mm -hmm. What is the most harmful current policy well, that this government to has? To be honest, Lisa, I would not really have an answer for that. Why is that? Because I, it's just from what I've observed over the last six months. I've seen so many different things and I'm going to learn and develop along the way um, to naming specifically those things. But today, you know, I've had so many other things to do, but today is not the day that I'm going to be able to do that. Okay. I'm just so being honest with you. In terms of politics, yeah. in terms of current MPs, who is the MP that you admire the most? Well, I absolutely think Winston is awesome. Um, Would you like to work with Winston Peters and his party? <laughs> I just like Winston. I look, to be honest, uh, we have not even discussed that. So I, I think as a leader, I'd have to be um, fair to the team that works with mm. me. I just don't want to go off and say, this is definitely what we're going to do. Because but there must be some parties that you think you're more compatible with. So what are your thoughts um, on who you're... Actually, I, I, I really liked... Um, um, I like Shane Jones. I quite like Shane Jones. Sounds um, like you're leaning towards New Zealand first here, uh, Hannah. <laughs> Well, I suppose I just like them. But I, I know we do have a, a relationship with Willie Jackson. Um, uh, who else do I have a passion for? Well, 
I suppose I just look and I just think, oh, this person's really good and that person's really good. But to be honest, I think it'd be unfair for okay. me to continue to, to name people because then it looks like I'm isolating mm. other people that I may actually enjoy getting to know. Your husband's not yet sure what role he'll play in this and you're not saying yet whether he'll stand in a seat. I'm just wondering, will you stand in an electorate? I'm not asking you to tell me which one, but yes, I'd like you to. personally will yeah, stand in like an electorate. To. Okay. Your husband has made the comment previously that there are a lot of perverts in Parliament. Do you do you share his view? <laughs> well, after the news over the last few days, I would say that there, I think one's been ex excommunicated out of the house now so maybe that one's gone I don't know whether there's there's been bullying do you think there's others there's been a um, whole lot of things well I don't know you might be able to tell me because I really don't know all the that facts comment, that comment wasn't in relation to that um, okay. is that what I said Lisa? no no that's what your husband okay, said well, so I'm wondering you know if you share hey, that view let him have his his say and I'll I'll speak for myself you want us myself. to get to know you so yeah, I'm asking exactly. you do you think that parliament well, is full I of think that perverts Brian and I will be separated and some of the things that we say because I'm not accountable for his, his Absolutely his you words. are not. That is why I'm Because I'm a woman in my you. own right yep. and um, I'd like to be judged as a woman in my own right. I want to be really clear about what your view is on um, homosexual relationships, gay relationships. What What is your view? Uh, I have got family that are gay. They know I love them. Do you approve of homosexual relationships? Does God approve of homosexual relationships? Well, I'm not God, Lisa. No, but you, Don't preach, ask me. The, you preach the word uh, can, of, can, so I'm yes, wanting yes, to yes, know yes, your but view. Let, let's put it this way. If a friend of mine is gay and they don't believe in God, don't love God, their choice. Um, if, to me, if they decided they wanted to live the, the Christian life I live, then there might be some decisions they have to make. I talk to... What does um, that mean? Can you be gay and a Christian? A, a well, proper, I, I, proper see, Christian? I see um, uh, Professor Linehan. We, he, we talked with him, and mm. he told us openly that he was gay, and he is... Uh, yeah, I'm asking yeah. you your views, because you say you want us to know you, yeah. right? Yeah. So I do want to know exactly yeah. what you think here, and I want you to be really clear with me. Yeah. So, on the issue of... People. Do you think? Do I think a gay person can be a Christian? I'm asking you what your your overriding view is. I think a gay person a... can be a Christian. Are they sinning by being gay? Well, or I being might in a be sinning if I lie to you, Lisa. I might be sinning if I beat my husband. I might be sinning if I'm gambling away our household money. If you're um, asking people no, no, to no, vote no, no. for you, I'm not going really to let you, to be clear on you put this. me in a box. I'm saying sin is sin, regardless mm. of to what degree it is. If I steal a lollipop from a dairy and I steal a car off the car lot, to me, that's a sin, regardless of the measure of it. So is gayness a sin? Fornication is a sin, adultery is a sin. Is gayness a sin? Well, I don't know. Would they see it as a sin? I'm asking you. Oh, yes, in my, my perspective, I would see it that way, as much as somebody that beat their wife, as much as anybody else. But this is the thing, Lisa. Our Lord is a gracious God, and because of the grace that he's shown to me while I was in sin, when I lived in sin, when I had a child out of wedlock, the graciousness he showed me, I believe he's capable of showing it to everybody else. So if a gay person repents, then... If a gay people gives their life to, to the Lord and lives the, according to the way they see God, who am I to judge them? I'm not God, Lisa, let's get that clear, I'm not God. No, but you said you want us to get to know you, so I think if but you're asking But why you only want to get to know me in one area? No, it's like No, no, no. It's like you are deliberately trying to discredit. So um, what about all the I'm other areas in my life? I'm asking you to be clear life? on your I've position. What's your position on immigration? Uh, well, I think we should look after New Zealanders first. There are a lot of New Zealanders that aren't housed. Um, so I just think that, hey, let's, let's so help some you, of our Kiwis would you, get homes. Um, let's put some of them into work. So um, are we allowing too many people to come and live in our country yes, from overseas? At, at this moment, at this time, while we're lacking work while we're, and employment, while we're lacking housing, I think we may be. But who knows in the future when we start housing our own people, caring for our own people, having our people getting jobs, um, maybe, maybe there'll be a time when we can open the gates a little bit wider. I'm not saying close them. I'm just saying let's be a little bit more mindful about New Zealanders. So would that mean lowering the numbers of people who are coming in? Would well, you I bring down the rate? I currently don't know how many are coming in. So do you have the number? Not off the top of my head. Oh, no, I, I don't know the number either. So 
but you think maybe we're letting too many people into the country? Uh, well, I'm not sure. If I knew how, if it was like right. 500 a year, well, is that too much? No. Should but I we, think 5,000 a year might be too much. Should we raise the debt cap to spend more on social services and what to? Uh, is that a policy around, I'm not sure what you're meaning. Do you, do you think, I think that we should be giving more money to social services? Because I think they already have a lot of money given to them. Okay. So, yeah. I, I mean, I, every day there seems to be multi-millions of dollars given to um, the social needs in our communities. So... And that's good. Hey, I don't have a problem with a that. Current, I think it's great. A current recommendation of a welfare report was to raise the level of benefits. So mm. Would you support raising the level of benefits by up to 48%? I actually think that might be a good idea if... Um, the parents were um, measured on what they spent the money on. Like if it was, we knew that it was going to the children, to the household needs. Um, not that I can tell everyone what to do and how to do a budget, but I think it would be great if we could, if they could be a little bit more accountable. Give them a little bit more to help them through their but struggle. But track their expenditure. Is not that what totally. You're just making sure that the children's well-being, the children have shoes when they they need them, that they have food in their tummy when they need it. That, that would be all. Um, and just to be clear, the funding for this political party, is any of it coming from Destiny Church? Absolutely not. So, Absolutely not. So how are you going to fund it? I've already had a few friends say that they would help us. Um, we've got friends outside the church that will help us. So uh, we've got many business people in the church. If they want to give to us personally, give to the party personally, that's their choice. Have you Where do other parties get their money from? Donations? Yeah, what will be donations? Have, same, same. Have you managed to sign any people up yet? How many members have you got so far? Not telling. The people. <laughs> have, you, have, you managed, have you managed to sign one, two, three people up? Yet? Not telling. Not telling. Okay, could you just give us, just, just give us a little tidbit, Hannah? <laughs> You're funny. Who. Who might be on your list that we're interested in? Who might be on your party list? <laughs> no. Not Clue? Telling. Anyone from the sporting world? Not telling. No, no, not from over over there, not the mozzies. Mm, any, any, anyone from, um, formerly from the Māori party? Haven't talked to anyone. Hannah, have you spoken to anyone from the Māori party directly? Um, we went to a tangi. Uh, recently, and there were a few people there from the Māori Party, but we did not talk about this. You didn't talk about politics no. or joining forces? No, no. no. You said... Hayana's uh, husband's who, passing. Who is, your, who is your core supporter? Describe that person to me. Who do you think it is? Tall, who are you going to appeal to? dark, handsome, gives good kisses. Beautiful to me, treats me like a queen. So you're talking That's about the man who supports you the most. Yeah. I'm asking you the people <laughs> that you think will sign up to your party. Who do you appeal to? I've got to? a lot of really good friends that... Um, Beyond them, though? Beyond them, who are you appealing to with this well, party? Well, I've met a whole lot of different people outside of church. Um, I think if you've seen me on Facebook and stuff, you'll see that I go out on a regular basis with a lot of friends. So are they urban? Are they suburban? Are they Pākehā? Are they Māori? Pākehā, Māori, island people, um, elderly people, young people. Hey, I'm open to all people. New Zealand, I'm here. And you can watch that interview with Hannah Tamaki on our website and our Facebook page. It is 23 minutes past five and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Keen for your feedback, you can text us on 2101. Is there space for another political party? You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Transport investigators have found the pilot of a doomed helicopter flight which crashed in bad weather on Fox Glacier wasn't trained or experienced enough for scenic operations. The Transport Accident Investigation Commission has published its final report on the crash which killed all seven people on board in 2015. And the failings by both the operator and the Civil Aviation Authority are numerous. Michael Crop reports. Cool. The 
helicopter was taking six passengers for a scenic flight around Fox Glacier and crashed shortly after taking off from the Chancellor shelf. Chief Investigator of Accidents, Captain Tim Burfoot, says photos taken by passengers show snow was falling and it's very likely the weather conditions, including visibility, were below acceptable limits. It is also very likely that when the helicopter took off from Chancellor Shelf and descended down the valley, that the pilot's perception of how high the helicopter was above the glacier was potentially affected by one or more of the following cloud, precipitation, flat light conditions or condensation on the inside of the helicopter windscreen. The report quotes a local pilot as saying in those conditions, you've got nothing to see, it's all white. Meaning it's very likely the pilot lost his depth perception and awareness of how close he was to the glacier until it was too late to avoid a collision. The helicopter was flying at high speed and even though some of the wreckage couldn't be recovered, no contributing mechanical issues were identified. But the problems that contributed to the crash run deeper than the pilot's decisions that day. He wasn't trained properly or senior enough to take scenic flights. In fact, the company, Aviation Adventures, training system didn't comply with the rules. And even though the Civil Aviation Authority, or CAA, knew the company had problems, Chief Commissioner Jane Mears says little to nothing was done. The operator had been allowed to continue providing helicopter air operations with little or no intervention from the CAA, despite the CAA having identified significant non-compliances with the operator's training system and managerial oversight. Chief Commissioner Mears says they made similar findings about CAA inaction in 2014 and reiterated them today, saying the CAA must always make a formal finding when it identifies serious safety issues. The CAA made significant changes, but despite this, CAA inspectors continued to overlook and not escalate problems found at Alpine Adventures. In a series of reports between 1997 and 2010, the Auditor General found similar problems with the authority's inspection regime, which the CAA always said it was addressing and making good progress on. Ms Mears says the Commission's concerned other operators' failings may also have been overlooked. But the CAA's director, Graham Harris, says he's satisfied an independent review of a sample of its reports between 2014 and 2018 shows there weren't bigger problems with its oversight and that the CAA's performance at that time was not representative of what it is now. Despite that, Captain Burfoot says the authority's problems run deep. It has uncovered a systemic issue and uh, we're not quite sure how wide that systemic issue goes. Ms Mears apologised for the length of time the investigation took, saying it was difficult to find out what had happened because the aircraft crashed in remote, tricky terrain, away from witnesses, and the helicopter didn't have a black box recorder. The company owner, JP Scott, was fined $64,000 in the district court in Christchurch last week and has also paid out $875,000 in reparation to the victims' families. The Transport Minister, Phil Twyford, says the CAA's performance in relation to to this company was not up to scratch. CAA recognises that its overall performance in regulating the uh, helicopter industry was not as rigorous or as tough as it should have been. Aviation New Zealand's members mostly include small operators and about two-thirds of the country's helicopter companies. Its chief executive, John Nicholson, says the failures by operators and the regulator are clearly concerning. He says the inconsistent approach by the CAA has left some operators nervous about inspections. There are instances that we know of where those systems aren't being followed, but in the main you will find that the industry is very responsible, very professional behaviour, and they are doing the right thing. Mr Nicholson says there's currently more of a focus on box ticking and form filling than ensuring safety in the skies, and the CAA needs to take a closer look at itself, how it works with operators and how it enforces the rules. The CAA's director, Graham Harris, says the report portrays a confronting picture of the ineffectiveness of its oversight of the operator in the lead-up to the crash, but he insists its processes have since improved. For Checkpoint, call Michael Crop there, they.
And time for some of your feedback before we get to headlines. This is just on our earlier interview with Hannah Tamaki, who's launched a political party today. Uh, Carolyn says, wow, Miss Hannah Tamaki's Destiny Church does little more than leech off the tithings of the poor. And hello, the motorbikes, boats and flash cars. And she and Bishop Brian own on the backs of the poor. As for Man Up, they thought they could queue jump and not even submit a correct formal application. Oh my God, have we found the New Zealand version of Pauline Hanson with Hannah Tamaki. Key says this person. Uh, and Joe says, does she not realise what her husband says and that he did not even apply to get man up into prisons? Um, and this one says, that woman makes my skin crawl. She is not particularly intelligent and scarily, I imagine she will pull many votes. But on the other hand, Carol says, I congratulate Hannah for a well-conducted interview and holding her poise while Lisa tried to rattle her. I think she will be worthwhile listening to. That one from Carol. And coming up on Checkpoint on RNZ National, the police should never have started a chase that ended with a crash that killed two children. The government signals its intention to loosen the purse strings ahead of the budget and the mystery of a woman missing three months without a trace. As always, we'd love to hear from you on anything you've heard on the programme so far today. Text us on 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. Email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. And now here's Susanna with the headlines. The investigation into the fatal Fox Glacier helicopter crash just released spells out numerous failings, including that the pilot wasn't properly trained or senior enough for scenic flights. The CAA has found the operator's training system was ill-defined and below standard. Also, photos taken by passengers show snow was falling when they were on the glacier and it's very likely the weather conditions were below minimum flying criteria. Destiny Church's leaders, Brian and Hannah Tamaki, have launched a new political party called the Coalition New Zealand Party. Mrs Tamaki will lead the party with the aim of getting into Parliament in next year's election. She told Checkpoint the party is not a response to the rejection of the Man Up programme in prisons, although she would push for it if elected. Bishop Brian Tamaki says he is fully supporting the party, but has not decided what his role will be. The police have been censured for a deadly pursuit which the IPC says never should have been started. The Independent Police Conduct Authority says the officer involved didn't make an appropriate risk assessment before signalling for the driver to stop and then commencing the pursuit. The driver was known to flee police and was likely motivated to avoid being taken into custody. The officer involved has been given further training and guidance to support better decision making. Cameron Bagri of Bagri Economics says the government's <coughs> books are world class and it shouldn't be afraid of taking on more debt as the economy slows down. The finance minister has signalled the government intends to relax its debt target of 20% of GDP to between 15 and 25%. That would potentially give it $15 billion more to borrow. Grant Robertson says the 20% target was always arbitrary and the focus should be more on the quality of spending. The investigative journalist Nikki Hager has told an inquiry the military breached the rules of engagement in Afghanistan. The Operation Burnham Inquiry is investigating allegations in the book Hit and Run that six civilians were killed in Afghanistan during a New Zealand-led raid in 2010 and the military covered up what happened. Nikki Hager says the former Prime Minister John Key, along with two former Chiefs of Defence and some SAS officers need to be held to account. Those are the latest news headlines on RNZ National. Our next news and weather update is at six. Thanks, Susanna. This is Checkpoint and I'm Lisa Owen. It's time now for business news with Madison Reedy. Madison, you were at Fonterra's headquarters today as the Dairy Giants announced its third quarter result. And what did they have to say? Well, they had a pretty good uh, third quarter result there. So that's the nine months to April. Their sales volumes were up 4%. Their revenue was up 1% to $15 billion. But let's be honest, that is not the real reason I was there. I wanted to hear more about their plan to cut debt by $800 million this financial year and also their plan to cut costs, their capital expenditure by $200 million too. Now all eyes, our all business journalists were looking at the same thing and wanting mm. to hear to hear the same answers there. Uh, and they say that with three months left after their full year that they're pretty much on track actually to meet both of those targets. They were pretty iffy around giving exact dollar figures 
figures as to where they were. They didn't really disclose much there. But they did say that they're on track and they're optimistic to meet both of those targets. Now, remember, they did just sell Tip Top, uh, their ice cream business, for $380 million. So that obviously goes some way uh, to reducing some of their costs and obviously allowing them to pay down a decent amount of debt there too. Although they did reduce their uh, forecasted earnings guidance uh, with this third quarter result. Uh, so they expected to make fif- between 15 and 25 cents uh, in earnings per share. They've now reduced that back to between 10 to 15 cents per share. Now, on our calculations, that would equal a full year net profit uh, come July of between 161.2 million and 241.8 million. Now, I put that to Fonterra. They have confirmed that that's the profit guidance that they're expecting to, to hit by July. Now, that would be quite a large turnaround from last year's loss of $196 million. Uh, but uh, even though they do expect to make a profit this financial year, uh, Fonterra does still remain under financial pressure. Now I asked the Chief Executive of Fonterra, Miles Hurrell, what those pressures were. So again, Australia ingredients is, is, is really feeling the, the, the pinch. You know, we've talked about you know the drought, the prolonged drought that, that has been in, in, in Victoria in particular, uh, the impact then on milk flows and increased competition for that milk. So that that also plays into the decision we've made, the tough decision to close Denton. So Australian ingredients has has been a big part of of that decision, uh, as is uh, Latin America. So uh, again, pretty tough times in Latin America. Um, We've seen some softening in certain categories in Chile, uh, and and, while Brazil is coming out of the doldrums from where it's been the last couple of years, not to the level that we expected or the pace we expected. So uh, that's played into our decision making. That there was the Chief Executive of Fonterra, Miles Hurrell, speaking to me earlier today about their third quarter result. Now, they did also uh, announce today a bit of an update on the strategic review of their assets. This is part of its reset. It's looking at reducing and simplifying its footprint Mm. all around the world and to focus on New Zealand. Uh, So it announced that it's reviewing its farms in China. It owns several of them, a few of them in joint ventures, a few of them it wholly owns. So it's reviewing the ones that it wholly owns. Uh, Now, over the years, it's poured about $1 billion into its China farms business and it has resulted in some losses there. They have lost money on this um, over the years as well, so seems a bit of an obvious choice to put up for review. Actually funny that they're reviewing it too because last time I met Miles in person at Fonterra, I asked him specifically if China farms was on the list. He obviously didn't shed much light on it then, but he has now. Uh, They're also going to review their joint venture with Nestle in Brazil. Now that wasn't necessarily all their idea actually. Uh, Miles Harrell also also told me that uh, that Nestle uh, actually reviewed their ownership of this joint venture and said, well, we don't really want it. So that then forced Fonterra to say, well, now we obviously have to look and see if we want it as well. Timely that they're going through a review mm-hmm. anyway. And they also announced, which he mentioned just there in that tape, that they're closing their factory in Dennington in Victoria, Australia. Now, sadly, that means that 98 people who work at that factory have now been made redundant. Okay, so uh, today also our one of our largest seafood companies is um, raising the red flag over climate change. This is Sanford. It's one of our country's largest seafood companies and the largest one on the stock exchange, definitely. Uh, so they had their half-year result today. And within that, they said that climate change is their largest business risk. So warmer temperatures have made it uh, more difficult to catch more fish. Uh, that's obviously putting pressure on their fish stock, specifically in regards to salmon. It's uh, salmon are struggling to grow uh, to the sizes that they want and that they used to be, so that's obviously a struggle for Sanford here. Uh, also, it's uh, meant increased biofouling on its muscle lines. Now, that's a build-up of algae on its shellfish, so while that sorts itself out, they obviously can't pick up as many shellfish out of the sea. They have to wait for that to recover. Now, Sanford isn't alone in uh, flagging concerns over climate change and saying the effects are here now. Uh, King, New Zealand King Salmon has also said uh, the same thing. Mm. And what else has been going on on the markets today, Maddie? Uh, the Interdex Top 50 Index rose 0.25%. That's a rise of 26 points to close at 10,263. The New Zealand dollar, that's buying at 64.9 US cents, 94.4 to the Australian and 51.3 to the British pence. Thank you. Madison Reedy there with our business update. An investigation into a police pursuit in Palmerston North in which a 15-year-old boy and his 12-year-old passenger died 
has found the police never should have started the chase. Ehia Maxwell and Meadow James died when the stolen car that Ehia was driving crashed into a ditch in May last year. The Independent Police Conduct Authority says the officer involved didn't properly assess the risk before signalling for the driver to stop and then starting the pursuit. I spoke to Ehia Maxwell's granddad, Dennis Maxwell, who told me he believes the chase was the wrong call. Everything is beautiful in hindsight, isn't it? Um, they knew who he was, so they knew he was a young offender. Um, so, you know, did they really need to chase him? I don't think so. Um, was it the right thing to do? I don't think so. Do you still not blame anyone in particular for what happened? I don't blame them per se. I don't blame any person per se. I probably blame a system that is so gung ho on, you know, the, the, the chase without really realising the consequences, especially where young people are concerned. I'm not the type of person who can judge anybody because I've made heaps of mistakes in my own life. You know, I was just lucky enough to survive them. Um, in my boy's case, it just wasn't the case, you know, and unfortunately it wasn't any him, it was another young life, an even younger life. But they knew who he was. Obviously, I don't know if they knew he or the passenger. Um, if it was me in particular, and I'm not a policeman, that I was chasing a, a, a young 15-year-old, I doubt that I would have chased. I would have just went around his house and kicked his ass and then taken him from there. But, again, uh, you know, I wasn't in the situation um, when this officer came across him. He obviously felt that that's, that's what was required, and so he went from there. What do you think, um, Dennis, are some of the things that, uh, well, contributed to your grandson dying at 15? What other things were in the mix? Oh, lots of things. His, um, his zest for life, I guess, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a term. He was a very high-strung boy, he, you know, but he was a boy. And when I say high-strung, he was just... Hyper, anyone who knows him, you know, knew he was just hyper as He was full on, and the only thing that really, you know, slowed him down was Redland, which, you know, what a poor um, substitute that is. He was too too, too much for uh, today's society, I guess. That was part of it. Obviously, um, things outside, which I didn't really know were going on with him. I didn't, I didn't realise he could drive a car. Um, you know, we were talking about, I was talking to him about cars and things like that and, you know, he wanted to get his licence, you know, all, all the things that young kids want to do. So you didn't even um, know he could actually drive? I didn't know he could drive, no. Until, uh, so he had, an, he had an incident earlier in the um, thing where um, um, I, because I was actually, he got pulled up in pram or something like that. Um, and he was in jail there, and then I went and seen him, and I said, who the hell was driving? He goes, oh, I was driving. You know, I didn't even, I said, I didn't even know he could drive. I said, do you know how to drive? He goes, oh, yeah. You know. Ehia was your first grandchild, and I imagine you had kind of big dreams and plans and hopes for him, and I imagine your family would have. So what, what has it meant to you all to lose him like this? Oh, it's huge. It's huge. I mean, we still feel the impact today. Um, you know, he's got siblings and, you know, they pine for him. His, daughter, his sister cries for him. His nieces and nephews, he got some young nieces and nephews too, and they they just absolutely loved and adored him. So, you know, he was a character. He was huge in life. But he was definitely an awesome sports person, um, natural talent. Um, so he, you know, he could have easily been an All Black or a Kiwi, um, a basketball. He was good basketball. He was good at whatever he put his hand to. So, you know, um, it's been huge. It's been huge on the fam- on our family. What do you miss the most about not having him around? Oh, just his cheekiness. His, his um, again, zest for life. He wanted. He wanted to live life. You know, he wanted to live life. And 
again, you know, he, he was too much for. Um, he was yeah, he was just full on, and you know, I really enjoyed that. I used to go and watch him play rugby. He was a prankster. He just he just loved life. So we know now that the officer involved didn't properly assess the risk before trying to pull the car over and then starting the pursuit. So we know now that mistakes were made by the police. What do you want to happen now? What do I want to happen? I want no more kids' lives to be lost. I I believe there has to be a better way than catch them at all cost sort of mentality that we, that we have at the moment. You know, I just, I, when I when it happened, I didn't want to work. I couldn't be, I was thinking, you know, what's the point? You know, I should be just staying home and looking after these kids and, and trying to put them in a, you know, on a, on a better path uh, rather than being at work, you know, 10 hours a day, six days a week, you know, to make a living. You know, is that really, is that really what it's about? I'm not angry with the police. I'm angry with a with a, a system that wants to chase at all costs. And that's Dennis Maxwell, who's the granddad of Ehia Maxwell. It is quarter to six, roundabout. I'm Lisa Owen, and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Uh, as always, we would love to hear from you. You can text us on 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. We're getting a lot of feedback um, from you on this new political party that has launched today. Hope to get to some of that a little later in the show. Northland's largest logging truck company has been given the green light to continue operating despite being ordered off the road by the transport agency for allegedly breaching safety rules. Secretly recorded video has also been released by the courts today showing the owner, former Mayor of Whangarei, Stan Semenov, purportedly telling a driver to flout the police and the rules or risk his job. Mr Semenov disputes the interpretation of the video. Our reporter Tom Furley has more. The company's more than 50-strong fleet carries half of Northland's log haulage. The transport agency wants to revoke their licence, arguing the company and its management failed to fix safety concerns brought up in two audits over three years. However, Stan Semenov Logging rejects the claims and is challenging the decision in both the District Court and High Court. At a hearing on Monday to argue whether the company should still be allowed to operate pending appeal, NZTA presented a secret video captured by a driver of another Stan Semenov company in late 2016. Its contents and publication were objected to by the company's lawyer. However, Justice Fata has allowed its release, even though the secrecy made it unfair to Mr Semenov. In the video, Stan Semenov can be seen talking to the driver and telling him not to take his brakes on the side of the road, but to fill in his half hour while the truck was being loaded. If you don't, want to, if you don't understand, you don't want to do it, you tell me. That's OK. But I'm not going to put up with it because I'm not going to have you the only Filipino that I'm having trouble with. Uh, only. Not you, you got some good work, but you're sticking to having your breaks, you know, the five hour breaks, whatever. Have them when you put full your timesheet in, have them there, and that's how we work. And that's why I made it pretty clear to you. Do you understand? Yes, but, uh, but I'm doing a legal for my love. All right, I won't argue with you anymore. I won't yeah. argue. I won't argue. Um, there probably won't be a job here for you. Yeah, okay. I'm doing. No, no, no. I'm not listening to that. When you come and work for me, I told you out there, you work under my 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 conditions and my rules, right? Everyone else's. You're the only one that's not doing it. During the conversation, a third man enters, and Mr. Semenov tells him what's going on. See these fellas here? Same as them. If they're going to work through lunch hours, you tell them you work through lunch hours, eh? He stopped down the Pomerado and I watched him there. It was more than half an hour he stopped, right? And it's bullshit. He's get behind on his work. He said, oh, that's legal to the law book. He's right, but that's not what we want in our company. NZTA requires transport drivers to take at least a 30 minute rest break every five and a half hours of work and considers time spent driving or performing work related duties such as loading and unloading as work. They've worked all day cutting metal up north, right? 
and they've come back and they've all and they've gone straight down there. And when they fill their timesheets out, I guarantee they'll be right. But they shifted. They shifted their lunch hour back to when they're loading, or when they, you know. And that's all we're saying to you. You see, you won't lose hours. You gain more hours. Mm. You gain more hours by doing it. I know the policeman says you got to stop. Him, yeah, he's not. He, he's he's not doing the company, mate. For David, released by the court, Mr Semenov rejects claims he was making the driver break the law. The message I was trying to convey to Nico was that November, being one of the busiest months of the year, was not the time to drag the chain, and that it was important that everyone in the business works at their full potential during the busy times. He said he had multiple complaints from staff about the driver and that now in his 70s he got tired towards the end of the day and would say things he later regretted. He said his comment about the police was an unfortunate expression for which he apologised and said he had a good working relationship with the police. I cannot specifically remember saying this to Nico and it must have come out in the frustration and heat of the argument at the end of a long working day. I do not recall any particular policeman who might have spoken to Nico and I think this was more a general comment along the lines that he needed to listen to his bosses at the company rather than what a policeman may have said to him. He said there had long been differences of opinion about where and when drivers should take their half-hour breaks. One option was whether the drivers should take breaks when at the port or on the skids, a reference to logging trucks in the forests. There they have places to stop and rest rather than having to stop on the side of the road on State Highway 1 where there are no toilets or facilities. It has always been our contention with the NZTA and the Police's Commercial Vehicle Safety Team, or CVST, that it is best and safest to take breaks in Northland at the points of destination. Due to the relatively short distances which are travelled in Northland, drivers are stopping frequently after no more than 2.5 hours driving and often stop at the points of origin or destination for 45 to 60 minutes. It was also my understanding from other transport operators at the time and based on my discussions with the CVST unit that the industry generally operated in that way, i.e. that drivers took their breaks at the points of destination. In a statement, the company said the court's decision found the recording inherently unfair to Mr Semenov and it could be taken out of context. It continues to challenge NZTA's decision in the courts. For Checkpoint, Tom Furley. Former captain Katrina Rore has been made, has made a return to the Silver Ferns, being named in the New Zealand World Cup netball squad in Invercargill this afternoon. Rore was surprisingly dropped from the Silver Fern squad, which played in the quad series in January, but is back along with shooter Bailey Mess, mid-quarter Shannon Saunders and defender Phoenix, Phoenix Karaka. Mess and Saunders haven't played for the Silver Ferns since the disastrous Commonwealth Games campaign last year when the side failed to win a medal. While Caraca last turned out for the Ferns in January last year. Now joining us now from Invercargill is netball reporter Ravinda Hunia. Kia ora, Ravinda. Was it Kia much ora, Lisa. Of, hey, is it much of a surprise that Nolene Todu has gone back to players that she'd previously well discarded? Uh, yeah, it is a little bit of a surprise, but you have to keep in mind that when she came on board, she was kind of inherited a team. She didn't actually choose the team that she went forward with when she was first um, put in as coach. So those selections were actually based on existing combinations in the ANZ Premiership. See, now she's had eight months. Her and the New Zealand selectors have had time to look at each team, each player individually, and with a heavy emphasis on fitness and high performance, these are the players that have shone the brightest. So, biggest surprise for you was what? I would have to say Bailey Mez was a big surprise for me. Um, I mean, the Mystics did finish at the bottom of the ANZ Premiership ladder this year, and at times Bailey Mez just you know failed to fire in terms of her shooting. But what she does bring to the fold is she's a great attacking player, and that athleticism would put her above many other attackers. So you can see why Nolene would want to work with her, really strengthen her skill set. So if that was a surprise inclusion for you, I mean, who missed out, do you reckon, who should have made it? 
there was one standout attacker in the midcourt who I thought was uh, a bit of a shoe and was Whitney Soonis from the Central Pulse. She plays wing attack. However, she doesn't shoot like Bailey Mez can, and Mez can actually play wing attack and goal attack. So maybe that's what got her over the line. I did also notice that all four shooters, Maria uh, Falau, Emilia Anikanasio, Tupai Sabirika and Bailey Mez are all very mobile shooters. None of them are goal shooters by trade, which means you stand under the hoop and don't do too much of the running around. All four of these shooters are mobile, so you can see Nolene's intent here. Okay, so the, the, well, the bottom line question is, can these guys win a World Cup, these women? I think under Nolene Toto, anything is possible. Um, she's shown that uh, with the Sunshine Coast Lightning, um, in her first year with the Australian franchise, she won that season and dominated the competition. Last year, she came back from adversity to take that title. And I think she has a great support network now. She's built that connection with all the coaches across the ANZ Premiership. So there is no reason why this team cannot um, win the World Cup or at least be top contenders for it. Thank you for that. Ravinda Hunia, who's been in Invercargill today to see the New Zealand Netball World Cup team uh, unveiled there. The government has unveiled plans to build a cycleway in a particularly treacherous route for cyclists between the capital and the Hutt Valley. Designs for the Nauronga to Patoni shared walking and cycling pathway are now up for public consultation, which will close later this year. It's predicted to cost $76 million, but $94 million has been put aside for the project. Charlie Drever was at today's announcement and she filed this report. Cycling to Wellington from Petone, you'll spend much of your time weaving in and out of cycleways and onto State Highway 2, next to cars travelling 100 kilometres an hour. And as Great Harbour Way Trust Chair Graham Hall explains, it's not for the light-hearted. At present you have to be very brave, especially to come back, heading back north. But either way, you're exposed onto the motorway for a certain section, so only the very brave. We call them the, uh, the road warriors, actually. Hut Cycling Network's Ron Biernick is one of those road warriors who commutes every day into Wellington by bike and he says some people have paid the ultimate price. At the moment people are putting their lives at risk. Um, I've had very scary moments. I know other people have had as well and we know there's been fatalities. But pleas from local organisations for a safer journey to and from the capital have now been answered. Associate Transport Minister Julianne Genta unveiled the government's plans to transform the coastal route into both a scenic destination and a congestion-free commuting option. It's a transformational project that is not only going to benefit resilience, what with our changing climate, but will create a substantial community asset that will benefit tourism, give people real choices about how to get around and be a great place for families to go on a beautiful day like today if it's a weekend. The designs include a flyover bridge as well as a five metre wide lane for pedestrians and cyclists alike, which will double up as a buffer zone against storm surges and erosion. There will also be room for a picnic area and fishing. But Cycling Action Network project manager Patrick Morgan says it's not a new concept. We've been waiting for literally 118 years for this. It was talked about in Parliament in 1901. So we're a patient lot. This day is, is a great day for us. Look, going from the hut to Wellington isn't so bad. There's a separated cycleway for some of that route. But coming back from Wellington to the hut is really unsatisfactory. Riding on the shoulder next to 100 km an hour traffic is not a good idea. The Transport Agency's Director of Regional Relationships, Emma Spate, says residents still have a while to wait before the pathway comes to fruition. We're expecting construction to start in 2021. The consenting process for a project of this nature, given the marine environment, we would expect to take uh, one to two years. And that just depends on the number of people who want to submit or have an interest in it and whether there's any appeals. If that process is shorter, then we would move into the construction phase earlier. Emma Spate says construction work should take about three years, but in the interim she says they'll be working with cycling groups to come up with some low-cost safety measures until the project is completed. For Checkpoint, Core Charlie Drever, TNA.
It's just over two minutes away from six, but we've got time for a bit of your feedback before the news at the top of the hour. Brian has got in contact about the interview that I did with Hannah Tamaki, who has launched a political party today. Brian says, are my human rights secured as a gay man? Can these parties, based on dusty old books written by humans hundreds of years ago, be able to remove my rights in a deal for their vote? Do I have to go into anxiety every three years? This is distressing. Are my rights secured, says Brian. Another person says, does Hannah Tamaki honestly believe she is capable of leading a political party? Margaret has got in touch to say, my feedback uh, to the interview with Hannah Tamaki is stunned silence. Um, and another person has got in touch to say, it is rare to see such a demonstrably unfit person for public office be so cavalier about her appeal policies and purpose. Um, on the other side of the coin, though, uh, Chris says, how refreshing, refreshing was Hannah? I was ready to be scornful, but was impressed. Such honesty is so rare in today's po- uh, politics, Chris says. Um, Rod Lewis has got in contact to say, at last, National have a likely coalition partner to replace ACT, the Hannah and Brian party. Can't wait for the cup of tea, says Rod. Claire says, Hannah Tamaki, maybe not a sophisticated thinker, but representative of a sector of our community. She seemed a nice person and said she wanted to learn more about politics and how she could contribute. I wish her well because I think there is a lot to learn. That one is from Claire. Um, And another person has said, oh dear, Mrs Tamaki is a very scary prospect as an MP candidate. Does she not realise the level of knowledge, responsibility, decision making skills and intelligence um, is needed to be in such an honourable position. My goodness me, her ego along with the circus show are a disastrous prospect. Um, Keep your feedback coming. If not this party, what new party would you like to see set up heading into the election? RNZ News at 6. Kia ora, ko Susana Leata with DNA. Hannah Tamaki and her husband, Bishop Brian Tamaki, have together launched a new political party today called Coalition New Zealand. They say it's a response to the harmful policies of the current government and the erosion of New Zealand values. Mrs Tamaki will lead the party with the aim of getting into Parliament in next year's election. She told Checkpoint it's not a response to the rejection of Man Up programme in prisons, although she would push for that if elected. I'd like man up into the prison, but it's not just about man up. Okay. It's about families. It's about the family court. It's about um, the health for the woman. Right. It's about, um, you know, let's take our time. And I did hear you let's, when you've listed yeah, those. I have heard that. Time. Euthanasia, I, I'm, that really concerns me. It's not a, it's not a government policy currently. So yeah. in, in uh, introducing but, but it, your party, yeah, but it, you it's said there were harmful policies. Well, I, I no, it's going to that. vote. It's going okay. to vote. Right. So you said there were harmful policies. Mm-hmm. What is the most harmful current policy well, that this government to has? to be honest, Lisa, I would not really have an answer for that. Hannah Tamaki. Brian Tamaki has not yet decided what his role in the new party will be. Transport investigators have found the pilot of a helicopter flight which crashed in bad weather on Fox Glacier, killing seven people, wasn't trained or experienced enough for scenic operations. The Transport Accident Investigation Commission has published its final report on the 2015 crash. Michael Crop reports. The Commission says it's very likely the poorly trained pilot crashed into the glacier in near whiteout conditions, where clouds, snow and ice were indistinguishable. It says the company's training systems and managerial oversight did not comply with the law, and even though the Civil Aviation Authority knew the company had problems, little to nothing was done about it. The Commission has made similar findings of CAA in action in the past. The CAA's Director Graham Harris says the report portrays a confronting picture of the ineffective of its oversight of the operator in the lead-up to the crash. However, he insists the CAA's performance has improved. Call Michael Crop then, they. The police district commander accepts the police were wrong to chase a vehicle in Palmerston North that left two teenagers dead. An independent report released today found that the officer should not have signalled the driver to stop or initiated the pursuit. It says a search should have been coordinated instead and that it was not worth the risk to the public to pursue the vehicle. Inspector Christy Wattener says those calls are the hardest for police officers to make especially when our focus is on preventing harm and keeping other people safe on the roads. But, you know, we do have to balance that up against our 
our role of preventing crime out there and it's a really tough balance but we do it every day mostly successfully and unfortunately and tragically in this case um, things can go wrong. Police Inspector Chris Dewatana. The investigative journalist Nikki Hager has told an inquiry the military breached the rules of engagement in Afghanistan. The Operation Burnham Inquiry is investigating allegations in the book Hit and Run that six civilians were killed in Afghanistan during a New Zealand-led raid in 2010 and the military covered up what happened. The book's co-author Nikki Hager told the inquiry that most, if not all, five attacks breached the rules of engagement and went against a directive from the United States. That directive said the command commander approving the strike must determine that no civilians are present. Mr Hager says the former Prime Minister John Key, along with two former Chiefs of Defence and some SAS officers, need to be held to account. The public hearing finishes today. Early results in India's general election suggest that the governing coalition of the BJP and its allies, led by the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, are heading for a comfortable majority. The National Democratic Alliance is poised to get well over 300 seats in the lower house of the Indian Parliament. The BBC's Rajani Vyadaini Narathan reports. With 900 million eligible voters, this is the largest democratic exercise the world has ever seen. The campaign was in many ways a referendum on the first term of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. As leader of the Hindu nationalist BJP party, his brand of politics has been seen as divisive, leading to the increased marginalisation of religious minorities in this secular nation. But his populist appeal has captured the imagination of many Indians, who've grown tired of decades of rule under the dynastic Congress party. Rajani Vaidya Nathan reporting. The former Silver Ferns captain Katrina Rore says she's prepared herself for the worst and expected to be missed out on the Silver Ferns World Cup squad. Rore was surprisingly dropped from the Silver Ferns in January but has earned a recall along with shooter Bailey Mears, mid-quarter Shannon Saunders and defender Phoenix Kardika. Mears and Saunders haven't played for the Silver Ferns since the disastrous Commonwealth Games campaign last year when the side failed to win a medal while Kardika last turned out for the Ferns in January last year. Rore says she said very little when she got the call from Nolene Taurua telling her she'd made the World Cup squad. I'd honestly protected myself for non-selection. So when Noel's rang me yesterday she said um, that I'd gone away and worked on what they'd asked and that I was um, consistent through the season. So, um, yeah, obviously doing what she said paid off. The veteran mid-quarter Laura Langman will captain the side, which also includes Casey Corpua, Maria Folau, Karen Berger, Amelia... Anne, Ekinacio, Tepaya Selby Rickett and Jane Watson. The next men's football World Cup in Qatar is three years in, in three years' time, won't be expanded from 32 to 48 teams. The FIFA ruling ends in any prospect of Oceania gaining direct entry to the tournament and they'll have to continue to go through a playoff game with another confederation. Meanwhile, the football ferns have beaten Mexico 2-1 in their latest World Cup warm-up match in New York. That's the news. Tonight on Night, Shobha Narayan has details of India's election result. Alison Balance has the latest science on New Zealand's regional accent, the Southland R, or post-volcanic R to be precise. And there's another treasure from our new children's website, storytime.rnz. A jumble, a jumble, that boomed in the box, and out came a couple of toe-nibbling crocs. Bite-sized chunks on nights after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Now the short forecast from Met Service to midnight tomorrow. In the west from Northland to Manawatu, also Taumaranui and Taiapi. Areas of cloud and isolated light showers clearing from Waitomo northwards with fine spells increasing. Areas of fog tomorrow morning. For the remainder of the North Island, also Nelson, Marlborough and Canterbury. Fine weather apart from areas of cloud or fog tomorrow morning. Buller and Westland mainly fine, however a few showers developing south of the glaciers tomorrow morning and the remainder of Westland tomorrow evening. Otago and Southland fine weather. Fiordland a few showers becoming more frequent tomorrow. Chatham Islands fine apart from a few light showers today. RNZ National with Indira Stewart is back with First Up at 5am tomorrow 
tomorrow at seven and a half past six. Thank you, Susanna. This is Checkpoint and I'm Lisa Owen. Politics with teeth. That is how Destiny Church founder Brian Tamaki has described the new political party his wife Hannah will lead. It will be called the Coalition Party and was launched today by the couple, but with Mrs Tamaki in the driving seat. The party will stand for family values and is desperately needed, according to Mr Tamaki, because the current government is taking New Zealand in the wrong direction. Joanna McKenzie was at the launch. So many of you, that's nice that you've come. Thank you very much. In a room lined with ornate stag heads and pig heads, Brian Tamaki welcomed the media and got straight to the business about why everyone was there. Our Kiwi way of life is in danger. Our freedom, our values, our culture as a people as we knew it, as New Zealand is living here, has been in danger because of the harmful policies that have been coming from this government. Before introducing his wife, he criticised the government and the National Party for lacking leadership. And he's confident that there are voters who want something different and it doesn't matter what their religious beliefs are. You will see that this is a party that more than just Christians uh, will connect to. I believe the wider mm. public of New Zealand are looking for a vehicle that can express what they feel about this present government. Then it was Hannah Tamaki's turn who echoed her husband's concerns about the current state of New Zealand. I'm not happy. I am concerned. I am worried. For this reason, I will be leading the new party, Coalition New Zealand, into the 2020 general election with the aim of entering parliament. She says it's time to make a stand. Their main aims are to raise the party vote and win an electorate, but she wouldn't be drawn on which constituencies would be targeted. But she did have a special message for National MP Alfred Naro, who's considering starting a Christian party. My message to Alfred is, I do not know you. You seem like a reasonable man looking for somewhere to call home. I imagine you and I may have different views, but overall I su suspect there are a number of things that we can agree with and have in common that we could build a relationship on. Therefore, it's that reason that I give you, Alfred, the opportunity to come and sit with me. A lot of criticism was levelled at the Prime Minister, particularly on the government's record on child poverty. When asked today about the new party, Jacinda Ardern didn't have a strong opinion. Obviously uh, we have had in our political history um, such parties um, enter into politics, um, none that have, that have managed to tip into the 5% into the threshold that, that enters them into Parliament. But look, it's an open democracy. Last time the Tamakis ventured into politics with the Destiny New Zealand Party in 2005, it didn't fare well. What do you think is going to be different about your new party that's starting from scratch, not too far out from the election? Well, you know, the neat thing is, new is new. And mm. um, doing something for the first time mm. is exciting. Now, just imagine if Colonel Sanders gave up the first time he wanted funding for his recipe. We would not have tasted that succulent chicken. And the party, she says, is a movement for everyone, including the LGBT community. Brian Tamaki is yet to decide what role he'll have within the party, but when asked if Mrs Tamaki was more palatable to the general electorate, he agreed. We thought it might be really good because Hannah is a very beautiful personality and um, she's quick-witted, she's intelligent. You have to say that because I'm your and, wife. Um, yeah, because you're going to give me a special bit later. Yeah. <laughs> The party is yet to officially register, but the Tamakis believe they will have the required number of members within weeks. For Checkpoint, called Joanna McKenzie a home. And we're getting an overwhelming amount of feedback on this story, actually. We've got time for just a little bit now. Uh, this person, Sharon, says, Kia ora, Lisa, the new Destiny Church-related party should not be allowed to call itself the Coalition Party. As the current government is a coalition, this is a direct challenge and hope by Destiny Church that people get them mixed up and vote for the Destiny Church Party by mistake. Cynical, says Sharon. Gary says, I don't believe in God, but if there is one, I thanked him or her that that interview with Hannah Tamaki came to an end. Thanks for your feedback, Gary. And this person says, wow, Hannah, wow. I thoroughly support having a range of political representation in our system, but that was deeply, a deeply disappointing launch of a political party. A kind Christian PR person needs to help, stat.
The government intends to ease its self-imposed rules around how much money it can borrow and give itself the licence to take on up to $15 billion more debt if it's re-elected. Finance Minister Grant Robertson says the government will likely change to a net debt target from 20% of GDP to a range of between 15 and 25% in a few years' time. Jordan Bond reports. A week out from the wellbeing budget, the government has signalled it might loosen its belt a little in the years to come. The Finance Minister, Grant Robertson, says its self-imposed debt limit of 20% of GDP will likely be broadened from the 2022 year to between 15 and 25%. We've been given advice that it is better to have a range than a specific point. Uh, that allows you more flexibility to respond to particular economic conditions. I'm very satisfied with our 20% debt target uh, and believe that that allows the balance that we want in the economy. This is simply an ability for a future government to have that range to be able to adjust to economic circumstances. That extra 5% corresponds to about $15 billion in possible borrowing. Grant Robertson says they're not necessarily planning on borrowing that, and when the time comes, it might be more responsible to actually reduce debt. He says advice from the Treasury is that a debt range gives them more room to borrow in case of an economic shock, such as a recession. It's about the balance. It's about making sure that we are making those investments, and I genuinely believe that we are, with safeguarding ourselves for the shocks that do come along from time to time, and to make sure that future generations aren't saddled with very heavy levels of debt. Um, we have went into the election with this promise. We've been able to make those investments, and we'll keep making them. But National says this is not about a rainy day or just in case. Its finance spokesperson, Amy Adams, says the government has overpromised and underdelivered, so it's now changing the rules. She says Mr Robertson's giving the government the licence to saddle the taxpayer with tens of billions of dollars more debt. They are now short of money, and so Grant is, within 18 months, giving up any pretense of fiscal responsibility. He's loosening the purse strings, and now he's saying, forget what I promised in the campaign, forget my pretense of being fiscally responsible, we now can't pay for what we've said we will do, uh, and so taxpayers are going to have to, to front it. Cameron Bagri of Bagri Economics says increasing the acceptable debt range is not only OK, it's actually more sensible than a hard target. He says 20% was always arbitrary and the reason for choosing it was more political than economic. Mr Bagri says the economy is slowing down and the government shouldn't be afraid to use its strong economic position to administer a fiscal shot in the arm. He says even if we hit 25% debt in a few years' time, the books would still be in fine shape. If we're at 25, we are at the world-class end of the spectrum. That will be a quality number. To me... The real attention here needs to be not just on borrowing per se, but where the money is going, you know, where they're investing in and the sort of return we're getting. And it need not be a cash return. It can be a social return. Mr Bagri says that's where the question marks are. Is this government making good investment decisions? Whether debt is 20 25% of GDP, I think that's irrelevant. To me, the real focus should be on the quality of the expenditure. It's not debt targets per se. It's where the money is going and when we're getting some bank wrap up. The loosening of debt limits is not officially a government or a Labour Party policy. Under the Public Finance Act, the government must signal its medium and long-term fiscal intentions. Mr Robertson says if it does adopt this, it'll only be from the 2021-22 financial year, after the next election. Itamaki Makoto for Checkpoint, Court Jordan Bond, Tane. It's almost 17 minutes past six and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. A mystery is how the police describe the disappearance of a mother of two, Bridget Simmons, who was last seen in Whangarei three months ago to the day. That confirmed sighting by Bridget's family was on Saturday, February 23rd, when her mother dropped her off at the countdown on Carmel Road, Whangarei. She hasn't been in touch since. Her bank card has been used three times, but the police can't confirm that the mother of two was the one who was using the card. Detective Senior Sergeant John Clayton has no theory about what's happened to Ms Simmons but is sure someone knows where she is. The longer we go on, the more worried I am, as is her family, who are really desperate to find out what's happened to Bridget. Um, she hasn't been in contact, which is really out of character, in, in particular uh, not to have contacted her children for such a long period of time. So did she have bank cards? Have her accounts been used? Have any of that sort of usual stuff been touched? What about a cell phone? 
Yeah, her cell phone hasn't been used uh, since, but we know on the last day when she was talking, the last day her mum saw her and dropped her off at the countdown on at Kensington in Whangarei, that was on the 23rd of February, she told her mum uh, that her phone was broken. Um, so that will probably be the reason we've had no luck with that phone. However, her bank accounts um, were used on three occasions uh, since the 23rd of February, one, once on the 9th of March at Kiwi Bank Otaika. Uh, there's a little ATM machine there in the Otaika shopping centre. We have a possible sighting of her using uh, that machine on that day, but it's unconfirmed. On the 11th of March at the Okara shopping centre, there is an ATM machine near the Whangarei warehouse, and at about 2.30pm, uh, an inquiry was made using that card. In other words, perhaps a balance check or something like that was made. We don't know whether that was Bridget or not. And then at 2.50pm, also on the 11th of March, uh, that card was used at McDonald's uh, in Raumanga. And since then, the card has not been used or bank accounts haven't been touched since. I want to be direct here, John. Do you think she's still alive? I certainly hope she is. We've got nothing to say that she isn't alive. Um, we're concerned for her welfare, obviously, for her family, but we've got nothing to indicate that she's not alive. We're still treating it as a missing person, and we really want to hear from someone that knows what's happened to her or where she is, because someone will know where she is. Those two bank transactions as such, which you aren't able to positively identify as her, why not? Is there no CCTV or the like? Yeah, CCTV has been quite difficult for us. For instance, the ATM machine, uh, we downloaded the Okara Shopping Centre ATM machine's uh, CCTV footage and it uh, had not been working for a few days before that and they weren't aware of it, so that was a dead end for us. The McDonald's, uh, the time the card was actually used, we checked, and nobody was actually in the store at that, that time. Uh, two vehicles went through. Uh, at, a, at a very, at a time very close to that time, one of those vehicles we were able to get a registration number for, and discounted that vehicle. The second vehicle there was no registration number, and all we know that that vehicle was a blue sedan. So is money still going to, into her account? No. Okay. So there's no money going into her account. There is money sitting in her account that has not been used. So tell us a bit more about the last time uh, someone from her family spoke to her. So she was she was dropped off at the supermarket in Whangarei, is that right? Yes, yeah, so she, she'd been staying at the Otaiki Caravan Park during January and up until about the 14th of February with a friend. From that date, she went up and stayed with her mum up in Kirikiri and her mum dropped her down at the countdown in Kensington on the 23rd of February, which is a Saturday. Now... After the 10-7 segment, or the appeal on 10-7, we believe we've identified a taxi driver that picked her up from there and took her to Matapo Street in Otangarei, a, a suburb here in Whangarei. We don't know where she's gone from there or, or whereabouts in Matapo Street she was uh, dropped off. So we certainly want to hear from anybody around that area that may have seen her, knows her or seen her since. Someone must know what's happened to her and where she is. If she's listening or she may get to hear this, what's your message? Oh, either contact the police or contact your mother um, and let them know where you are and let them know that you're all right. That was Detective Senior Sergeant John Clayton. Now, anyone with information about Bridget Simmons' whereabouts can contact Detective Constable Joseph Rubin. And we're going to give you a number here. It is 09 945 4733. And again, 09 945 4733. Or you can call Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 555 1. Crime Stoppers number again, 0800 555 Triple one. Survivors of sexual abuse say they are outraged it took more than 15 years to defrock a pedophile priest after he was convicted. Former Dunedin priest Magnus Murray has been removed from the priesthood following a formal church judicial process. This was after he pleaded guilty to sexual offending against four boys between 1958 and 1972. While some have welcomed the defrocking, others say it is too little, too late. Tess Brunton reports from Dunedin. 
Dunedin sexual abuse survivor Daryl Smith says he's angry that Magnus Murray wasn't defrocked earlier. He knows someone who suffered at the hands of Magnus Murray and says the church has had the wrong priorities. He is a convicted pedophile and he gets treated better than the survivors do. And that's from the Catholic Church, you know, they, they treat him a lot better in Auckland than they do when uh, the survivors in Dunedin, his victims, get treated. I mean, I know personally some of them here in Dunedin are quite upset about it. Magnus Murray previously served as a Catholic priest of the Dunedin and Hamilton Diocese before retiring in 1990. He was later found guilty of abusing four Dunedin boys over a 14-year period and was convicted in 2003. Despite that conviction, he retained the title of priest. The church judicial process only started in February last year, 15 years after the conviction, and the decision was revealed yesterday. Daryl Smith says it's the indefinite wait for action that compounds the suffering of survivors. It makes it even harder for the person to cope going, but where's the Vatican? The Vatican's not taking them seriously about deflocking. He should have been deflocked in 1970s. Male survivors at that our national advocate, Ken Clearwater, says the wait was unacceptable and he wants to know why it took so long. It's a continuation of the Vatican and the Catholic Church in covering up the sexual abuse of children. Uh, no other organisation in the world would be able to get away with what they get away with. So they may be feeling good about themselves at the moment, but it's totally unacceptable the length of time. He should have been defrocked the moment that he was convicted of sexually abusing children. The Catholic Bishop of Hamilton, Steve Lowe, says the former priest's age and health, he's now in his 90s, complicated the process. He says he hopes the defrocking will bring some sense of justice, even though it doesn't take away the harm he inflicted. Bishop Lowe says the defrocking is a signal that sexual abuse has no place in the church. And while it's a very late step forward, Ken Clearwater says victims will relive the trauma and will need the support they never got at the time. Now that he's been defrocked, of course, that will bring it all back for those survivors. So they'll be going through a lot of trauma um, and also the fact that they hadn't had anything happen before. Defrocking doesn't really make a difference for some survivors. Daryl Smith says it's more of an issue of public image than justice. He has a message for the church. The Catholic Church needs to wake up. We're not talking about the need and die this. We're talking about a whole lot need to just wake up. Wake up and go, hey, we've done this. Put your hand up and be honest and go, hey, no more cover-ups. Hand over documents to police. Hand over pedophiles to the police that you know and you've hidden or you've sent overseas. Hand them to the police. Bishop Steve Lowe urges anyone who has experienced sexual abuse by a priest or church member to contact the church's National Office of Professional Standards. There's an 0800 number on its website and a message encouraging other victims to come forward if they wish. It says the church will assist anyone who wants to report any abuse directly to the police. In Dunedin, Cortez Brunton, Tene. Students at an Auckland college held a lie-in this afternoon in preparation for the second nationwide student strike for climate action. They will join thousands of others who will ditch school to lie down on Auckland's Queen Street tomorrow as part of an ongoing climate protest. The first nationwide school strike for climate action came to an abrupt halt on the 15th of March as news of the Christchurch mosque attacks spread. The Auckland organisers says they're ramping up their efforts this time in a bid to get the government to declare a climate emergency. Emergency. Brooke Jenner went to Western Springs College to take a look. These Western Springs College students are practising for tomorrow's lie-in on Auckland's Queen Street. A Year 13 student and the Auckland strike organiser, Luke Weijon, proves it's no easy task to organise hundreds of student activists ahead of another day of climate strike action. He says they'll meet in Aotea Square at midday tomorrow before marching down Queen Street and will lie down to raise awareness. A lion is this protest technique where we all lie down to say that we think the government needs to wake up about an issue. So this is a practice for tomorrow's huge event where we'll all be doing the same thing but on Queen Street with more than 20 other schools from around Auckland. There'll be thousands of us there. And they'll do it in the middle of intersections and close off Auckland's busiest street. With thousands expected tomorrow, the students are confident they'll beat the local lion record of 700 people. Their aim? To get the government to declare a climate emergency and have a zero-carbon bill passed with cross-party support.
One of the national co-conveners, Raven Maida, says students and other city centres have strikes of their own organised, as well as other plans. Across the country we'll be seeing uh, students doing strikes, doing tree plantings, beach cleanups, letter writing um, and a few different um, tactics. She says she wasn't expecting the huge turnout last time, so she's got the police on board tomorrow for safety reasons. We were overwhelmed by the response, so um, this time we know that, that we're expecting large crowds and we've been able to more effectively work with police um, to ensure that there is adequate response and support from them. For students at Beckenham, Tegura or Puroto Primary School in Christchurch, tomorrow's strike was front of mind this afternoon. Especially when Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern dropped into the school to speak with a small environmental committee about it. Now I come because very soon young people from around New Zealand are going to be marching because they're really worried about an issue called climate change. Who's heard about climate change? Everybody so smart and so Year 8 student Lucy Gray is only 12 years old, but is also a national co-convener of the strikes. She had the job of chairing the discussions with the PM. Telling her our demands and what we would like to see happen and we're just going to be asking her some questions. Yeah, it's really amazing that she's flown down to meet with us. It's incredible. We want to welcome her and um, work together with her to see how we can try and solve this issue. Lucy Gray says she's excited to hit Hagley Park tomorrow to parade with posters, sing, chant and present demands. We've invited all of our leaders to um, let them hear our concerns and to really invite them to be part of this with us so we can all work together to help put an effective and ambitious zero carbon act and declare a climate emergency. Raven Maida says students are prepared to continue strike action until the government meets their demands. I tamaki makoro o te hotaka o te ahi ahi nei, ko brook jena tēnei. We're almost out of time, but let's get through some of your feedback very quickly. We've had quite a lot of feedback on the Stan Semenov logging video. A lot of you concerned for the worker in that video. Thanks for your feedback. But let's go out uh, talking about the party that Hana Tamaki has launched today. This person says, I'm a lesbian and a Christian. I am appalled by Hana Tamaki's comments to compare being gay to wife beating. Just leaves me breathless. RNZ News headlines at half past six. Brian and Hannah Tamaki are billing their new political party as a response to the harmful policies of the current government and the erosion of New Zealand values. The pilot of the fatal helicopter flight, which crashed in bad weather on Fox Glacier, wasn't trained or experienced enough for scenic operations. The police officer, censured for a deadly pursuit, which the IPCA says never should have been started, has been given further training on assessing risk. And the investigative journalist Nikki Hager has told an inquiry the military breached the rules of engagement in Afghanistan. Those are the headlines. Our next news is at seven. Take the pulse of the day's news every weeknight at 10. I get the sense that the man is still on the, on the premises. Lately is your late night eye on the latest headlines and the people who are making them. If you're not going to talk about the really interesting topics, such as ones he really is passionate about, well, why bother? 